If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 13, since others have been subject to some difficult names, I thought that I shouldn't be immune from having to show that I don't just expect them to read difficult names without doing it myself. In fact, I had some fingers pointed at me saying, how come you never talk about all the ites and just say the ites instead of mentioning all of them? But nevertheless, Joshua 13. When we read passages like this, it's easy for us to gloss over it because there's a lot of names and it doesn't look like there's a lot of interest here that might capture us. You know, it's better listening about how Deborah put a peg through someone's head than reading a lot lot of names. Uh, But nevertheless, it is given to us by God the Holy Spirit uh, for our benefit. And so when you read through passages like this, what I would encourage you to do is sometimes look at the broader themes that come out of passages like this, rather than trying to get into the minute detail of uh, what comes out of the passage. So Joshua 13, if you've got your Bibles, uh, join with me. When Joshua was old and well advanced in years, Yahweh said to him, you are very old. Now, he was about 85, so if you're 85, I don't know how you want to take that, but nevertheless, you are very old, and there are still very large areas of land to be taken over. This is the land that remains, all the regions of the Philistines and the Geshurites from the Shehor River on the east of Egypt to the territory of Ekron on the north. All of it is counted as Canaanite, the territory of the five Philistine rulers in Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath, Ekron, that of the Avites, from the south or the land of the Canaanites, from Arar and the Sidonians as far as Aphek, the region of the Amorites, the area of the Gebelites, and all the Lebanon to the east from Baalgad below Mount Hermon to Lebo Hamath. As for the inhabitants of the mountain regions from Lebanon to Mishrapoth, Maim, that is, or the Sidonians, I myself will drive them out before the Israelites. Be sure to allocate this land to the Israelites for inheritance as I have instructed you, and divide it as an inheritance among the nine tribes of the half-tribe of Manasseh. The other half of Manasseh, the Reubenites and the Gadites, had received the inheritance that Moses had given them east of the Jordan, as the servant of Yahweh had assigned it to them. It extended from Arur in the rim of the Arnon Gorge, and from the town in the middle of the gorge, and included the whole plateau of Medeba as far as Dibon, and all the towns of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who ruled in Heshbon, out to the border of the Ammonites, It also included Gilead, the territory of the people of Geshur and Maka, or of Mount Hermon, and all of Bashan as far as Salakar, that is, the whole kingdom of Og in Bashan, who had reigned in Ashtaroth and Edrai, and had survived as one of the last of the Rephites. Moses had defeated them and taken over their land." But the Israelites did not drive out the people of Geshur and Maka, and so they continued to live among the Israelites to this day. But to the tribe of Levi, he gave no inheritance. Those are important words. No inheritance, since the offerings made by fire to Yahweh, the God of Israel, and the in- uh, are their inheritance, as he promised them. This is what Moses had given the tribe of Reuben, clan by clan. The territory from Arur on the rim of Arnon Gorge and from the town of the middle of the gorge and the whole plateau past Mediba to Heshbon and all its towns on the plateau including Dibon, Bamath, Baal, Beth Baal, Meon, Jahaz, Kedemoth, Mephoth, Kiriathim, Sibma, Zereth Shahar and the hill in the valley, Beth Peor, the slopes of Pisgah, and Beth Jesmoth, all the towns on the plateau and the entire realm of Sihon, king of the Amorites who ruled at Heshbon, Moses had defeated him, and the Midianite cheats Evi, Rechem, Zer, Hur, and Reba, princes with the Sihon who lived 
in that country. In addition to those slain in battle, the Israelites had put to the sword Balaam, son of Beor, who practiced divination. The boundary of the Reubenites was the bank of the Jordan. These towns and their villages were the inheritance of the Reubenites clan by clan. This is what Moses had given to the tribe of Gad, clan by clan. The territory of Jazer, all the towns of Gilead and half Ammonite country as far as Arur, near Rabah and Heshbon, to Ramath, Mitzpah, and Betonim, and from Mahanaim to the territory of Debir, in the valley of Beth Haram, Beth Nimrah, Succoth, and Zaphon, with the rest of the realm of the Sihon king of Heshbon, the east side of the Jordan, the territory up to the end of the Sea of Kinnereth. Kinnereth sorry. These towns and their villages were in the inheritance of the Gadites clan by clan. This is what Moses had given the half-tribe of Manasseh. That is, to the half-family of the descendants of Manasseh, clan by clan. The territory extending from the Mahanaim and including all of Bashan, the entire realm of Og, king of Bashan, all the settlements of Jay and Bashan, 60 towns, half of Gilead and Ashtaroth and Edrai, the royal cities of Og and Bashan. This was for the descendants of Maker, son of Manasseh, for half the sons of Maker, clan by clan. This is the inheritance Moses had given when he was in the plains of Moab across the Jordan east of Jericho. But to the tribe of Levi, Moses had given no inheritance. The Lord, the God of Israel, is their inheritance as he promised them. Let's pray. Our Father, we recognize that when we read passages like that with so many different names, at one level it might just seem rudimentary for us to read through it and then move on to the next passage and hope that we get something a little different. But you have included this in your word for a purpose. And so we pray that as we seek to understand some of the broader themes that come out of this passage, that you would give us insight that you would give us understanding, that you would lead us and direct us by the power of the Holy Spirit, whom you've given us to enable us to understand your truth, and that we might leave here having been enriched by your word, encouraged by it, and if necessary, challenged by it. And we pray this for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ and his sake alone. Amen. Now, a week ago, I think almost to the day, some of you may have read in newspaper reports or on your phone or wherever you access your news that Sean Connery died. Now, Sean Connery, for those of you who don't know who he was, although I suspect some of you older folk will know who he was, was most famous for the role he played in the James Bond movies. He was the first James Bond movie, and he got the whole uh, sequence going and often is considered as the epitome of what James Bond is supposed to be. And he died at the age of 90 in the Bahamas. And as I read that, and I began to reflect to myself, God had given Sean Connery 90 years on this earth. That's quite a long time. I mean, if you're 20 here this evening, and you think of 90, that's 70 years still left to go, if, of course, you get there. If you are 60, then it's only 30 years. If you are 80, it's only 10 years, and it becomes a little bit more relevant to you the older you get and the closer you get to, to those kinds of milestones. And the question I always ask myself at that point is, where is he now? He had 90 years in this world, and now he's dead. Where is he now? Has he gone to be in the presence of God? Or is he experiencing the horrors of hell? And it's a really important question to ask ourselves. Because at the end of the day, and I don't mean to be negative this evening, as you will see, and I don't mean to be depressing this evening, but at the end of the day, Every single person sitting here, every single one, without exception, is going to depart from this world. You're going to die. It's not very encouraging news, is it? 
But that's the reality. And the only thing that might spare you that, if you're a Christian, is if Jesus Christ comes. That's the only other possibility. But unless that occurs, you are going to die. And the problem with death is none of us know when it's going to happen. Thank goodness. Imagine if God came to you and said to you, by the way, Ian Dean, once you hit 60 on March the 4th at 12.15 p.m., you're going to die. Can you imagine how you would dread getting closer and closer and closer to that day? It would be a nightmare. So God doesn't tell us when. But he does remind us that because we live in a broken world, none of us escape the clutches of death. And death has no favorites and it has no age limit. Some get to live to 90. Some don't even make their first birthday. That's the reality of the world we live in. I had a friend at school who died when he was 19, year after he left school. I had another one when I was six years old that died while riding a bike that fell off his bike and broke his neck. Six years, that's all he got. And so we need to be sure of where we are headed. And this passage is all about inheritance, in case you missed it. It's all about the inheritance that the Israelites get to experience. God has made certain promises to them. And now that Joshua is getting old, so between chapter 12 and chapter 13, there's a significant period of time that has occurred. And so the invasion of the land has continued. And now they've reached the point, because Joshua is getting old, that God says to him, Joshua, it's time to divide up the land. It's time to give the inheritance to the people before you die, before you depart from this world. And what is interesting about this passage is some of that has yet to be conquered. So there's still some territory that remains under the control of the Philistines. Now, the Philistines at one level are not the Canaanites, are they? And God has promised to give the land of the Canaanites to the Israelites. But the problem is that the Philistines have invaded part of the land that used to belong to Canaan. And so in spite of the fact that they are not Canaanites, they are living in the land that God has given as a gift to his people. And so they still need to be removed. But the Israelites haven't got that far yet. And so there's a territory to the south, the Philistines, and then there's an 80-kilometer corridor to the north that is yet to be taken. But in spite of that, the territory in the main, most of it, has been conquered by Israel. And what I want you to notice then, firstly, is the certainty of our inheritance as a Christian. The certainty of our inheritance, verses 1 to 7. There is some work uh, left to be done, uh, but Israel has mainly received the land. And the reason that they have been able to conquer the land is because God has gone before them. God has honored their, his promises. God has come through. And it's important, for God had promised them that he would enable them to take the land. And notice what God says to them about the land not yet taken. He says to the Israelites, I will drive out the inhabitants that remain in the land. In other words, there is absolute assurance given to Israel that God will enable them to conquer the remaining parts of the land that remain yet in the hands of the enemies. And you see, in that sense, at that level, what we need to understand from this in terms of the inheritance is that it is a reminder, it's pointing us forward to a much greater inheritance. And in the same way that God promised to give an inheritance to the Israelites, he has promised to the believer to give them an inheritance. And that inheritance which he has promised to the believer is not secured by the believer's own effort, but is secured by God and is promised by God and given by God. And it is secured for the believer, not because of any work that you and I have done, but as a result of the finished work of Christ on the cross. So that you and I can know with absolute certainty that if we have a relationship with Jesus, nothing can rob us of that inheritance that God has promised to all who love him. So 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20, for example, as Paul Wright says, But Christ has indeed, indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of all those who have fallen asleep. In other words, all of those who have died. So Christ is raised as the firstfruit, and all those who have died 
will follow one day when Christ comes. Or John 14, 2, listen to the words of Jesus. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. So that Jesus assures the believer that he has gone ahead of the way to prepare a place for us and we can be certain of the inheritance that you and I will receive. Ephesians 1 verse 13 and 14 says that God, in, in order to give us the confidence to know that our inheritance is secure, gives us the Holy Spirit. Listen to Ephesians 1 14. Very important. Having believed, you were marked with him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Do you hear those words? Guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So God has gone ahead of the way, Jesus Christ, and has secured our inheritance, guarantees it, and gives us the Holy Spirit, who is our deposit and affirms for us or guarantees the certainty of what lies ahead. Which means that if you are a believer here this evening, can I say to you with absolute confidence, your security is in Christ. One day, whenever you depart from this world, know with absolute certainty, you don't have to fear about whether you've lived up to a certain standard or not, because none of us meet the standard. Jesus Christ has already met the standard, and we rest in what he has done, and therefore our inheritance is absolutely certain. And so you don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear what lies ahead. It's the same as when a couple get engaged. That word that he uses for a deposit in the Greek is the word arabon. And it means literally an engagement ring. When a couple decide to get married, what happens? The guy, well, it's, sometimes it's a little bit reversed today, but the guy, most in most cases, gets a ring and he goes to his girlfriend and he proposes to her and he takes that ring and he puts it on her finger. What does that ring symbolize? It symbolizes a promise that he will marry her. It's given to her as a guarantee that he will marry her. And it's that sense that the Holy Spirit has given a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Secondly, I want you to notice the gift of our inheritance. Verse 6. Let me read it. Verse 6. As for all the inhabitants of the mountain regions from Lebanon to Mishrapath, Maim, that is all, the Sidonians, I myself will drive them out before the Israelites. Be sure to allocate this land to Israel for an inheritance as I have struck, instructed you and divided as an inheritance among the nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh. What I want you to see for all of that is that the inheritance that we have, the allotment of the land is a gift of God to Israel. And it's really important because that gift that God is giving to them of the land is again pointing us forward uh, to the gift that we have as an inheritance. What we need to constantly be reminded of is that Israel going into the Canaanite region and taking that land is not because Israel deserved it. It's not because Israel were better than other nations. It's not because Israel had some merit before God. In fact, Deuteronomy 7.7, 7, let me read it, verses 7 and 8, makes this statement. The Lord did not set his affection on you, and choose you, talking to Israel, because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you are the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of the king of Egypt. And the point that is being made there by Moses as he reminds the people is that they are chosen not because they in some way deserve it, but because God is giving them the gift of himself. And their land is a gift from God. It's not something they earn or deserve. And that is repeatedly mentioned in Joshua of how God gave them. God strengthened them. God 
defeated the enemies. And the reason that the Lord is mentioned frequently in Joshua is to remind you that the hero of the story is not Israel and their abilities, but it's God who is the hero and God fulfilling his promises and God giving them the land as a gift. And you know, if there's one thing that you and I need to be reminded of frequently, well, maybe not you, but I do, is that our salvation is an absolute free gift from God. Sometimes I think, we think, that we are in some measure deserving of God's gift of eternal life. You know, there's a sense in which we think we're not really that bad. We haven't murdered anyone. We haven't committed any bad crime. We haven't stabbed anyone. or We haven't done anything that's overtly bad in that sense. And so, you know, we're quite nice people, and we think we're okay. And yet, Scripture repeatedly reminds us that we're not okay, that we are plagued by the problem of sin, that we are contaminated from head to toe, that we are rebels at heart, that we have rejected God. And as a result of rejecting God, we stand under the condemnation of God. His wrath rests upon us because of our rejection and rebellion against him. And God doesn't send Jesus Christ because we are lovable. We are unlovable. But God sends Jesus Christ because he is a God of love. And he must love and always loves. And he sends it because of who he is, not because of who we are. And we don't stand before that God with any sense of merit before him. We don't say to him, I deserve eternal life. I deserve to be saved. We don't stand and put God in the dark and say, these things shouldn't happen in the world. Uh, You shouldn't allow these things to happen as if God were somehow accountable to us and answerable to us according to the standards of what we consider to be good and bad and right and wrong and how God should or shouldn't move. Rather, we recognize our absolute poverty before God. We understand that were it not for God exercising His grace and love, all of us would be rightfully, eternally condemned to everlasting punishment. That is what we deserve. And when you think about that, it's a frightening thought, isn't it? I don't deserve salvation. I deserve for God to put me in hell and to exercise His wrath against me forever. That's what I deserve. That's where I belong, in and of myself. And it's only because God has reached out in grace, and it's only because Jesus Christ has come into this world and sacrificed himself on my behalf and offers me eternal life that I have any chance of being able to enjoy heaven one day in the new created world with God forever. It's all about Jesus. It's all about what he has done. It's all about what he has secured. Everything centers on him and his work. And I come before him as a beggar, as one of the people put it, a beggar. And I come to him with nothing in my hands. And I simply cast myself on the mercy of God. And I experience his grace and mercy. And so Ephesians and Romans, Romans uh, 3 verse 10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Those are very, very sobering words. Because a lot of people think that they're good people by the standards by which they evaluate what is good and what is not. As long as I don't hurt others, as long as I toe the line, as long as I obey the law, as long as I might give to some charities... And then Isaiah cuts across all of that, and he says, even your good works, even your good deeds are like filthy rags in the sight of God. That's very sobering. There is nothing I offer to God that is commendable. 
There is nothing I bring to God that I put on the table that is attractive to Him. I simply cast myself at the foot of the cross as one who deserves to be condemned forever and cry out to Him and say, Lord, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. And God in grace exercises that mercy and draws me in a relationship to himself. And then thirdly, I want you to notice the nature. That's the gift of our inheritance, the nature of our inheritance. Now, I just want to read two verses here. Although there's a lot more. We could read uh, verses 8 to 14. But I want to read verse 14 and verse 33. Um, but to the tribe of Levi, he gave no inheritance since the offerings made by fire to Yahweh, the God of Israel, are their inheritance, as he promised them, verse 33. But to the tribe of Levi, Moses had given no inheritance. The Lord, the God of Israel, is their inheritance, as he promised them. Now, Israel's failure to carry out God's command to drive people out the land was going to create all kinds of problems in the future. It was going to continually dog them again and again and again. And only under Solomon, really, after David has died and David, has, uh, being a military man, has been able to conquer some more land, only under Solomon do they experience the full extent of the land that God had promised to them. And that doesn't last long because as soon as Solomon dies, there are all kinds of wars and bit by bit they begin to lose the land that God has given them. And one of the problems of Israel was their failure to remove those who were in the land and their failure to persevere by removing those in the land. And it was their unwillingness to obey God to the letter, to submit in perfect obedience to Him that causes them to end up having to struggle forever with this problem of the people languishing in the land. What they should have done after the initial conquest is they should have persevered. And their failure had long-term implications. And that failure to take all of the land anticipates in the believer's life the failure to appropriate all of God's promises in Christ. When we fail to persevere like them in our faith, our warfare is not fought in the physical realm. Our warfare is fought in the spiritual realm. And in that spiritual realm, God has given us weapons to fight the battle. And when we don't persevere in that spiritual battle, and when we succumb to temptation, when we give in to those things that would tempt us to sin against God, we do exactly what Israel did. We fail in our efforts to conquer those temptations that are in front of us, and we suffer the consequences of those failures. Now, we live between two worlds. There is no doubt from a de declarative point of view, believers have been declared perfectly holy before God, but that holiness needs to be worked out in everyday society. And in order to work that holiness out, you and I need to ensure that we are well equipped so that when temptation does come, you can resist and you can push it away and you can draw on the strength that comes from God so that you can appropriate by faith and experience all the blessings that God has won for us in Christ. And we miss out on those blessings when we fail to live in a way that is pleasing to God, when we fail in our holiness. So, for example, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 to 13. Let me read these. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and they passed through the sea. They were baptized into Moses, into the cloud and in the sea. They ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. These people sat down to eat and drink and gave up to indulge in pagan revelry. That happened repeatedly in the land. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. 
and one, in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by a destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and been written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Now listen. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under that. Now I want you to hear what Paul is saying. Don't allow yourself to fall prey to the temptations. Their failure to conquer the land allowed those religions in the land to constantly draw them away from God till eventually God had enough and God sent the nation into exile for 70 years as his judgment against them. You and I need to learn from the lessons of Israel. Failure to conquer the land was allowing those religions to become a constant snare to Israel. And Paul says, be careful that you don't think that somehow you are above failure, somehow you are above fall falling, somehow you are strong enough in and of yourself to resist. But know this, whatever temptation comes your way, no matter how strong and powerful it is, no matter how enticing it is, no matter how deceiving it is, know this, God is able to help you to resist that temptation. You must draw on his strength and he is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can bear up under it. Now, I want you to hear what he's saying. He's not saying that God will necessarily take away the temptation. But he is saying that no matter how powerful the temptation is, God will not let you be tempted in a way that is beyond your ability through the grace of God made real by the power of the Holy Spirit to resist that temptation. Do you hear that? There is no sin that you and I commit that is irresistible. Not one. Every sin you and I commit is resistible through the power of God by the Holy Spirit. And we don't resist because we don't draw on God's grace. We don't resist because we think we can do it on our own. We don't resist because we put ourselves in the place of temptation. We don't resist because we don't get rid of those things in our lives that cause temptation. And we flirt with them. And we put ourselves in places of danger until eventually we succumb to those things instead of looking to God to strengthen, empower, and enable us. And hear carefully. God says, no temptation, not one, no matter how deceiving and attractive it is, and temptation is always attractive, otherwise it wouldn't be temptation. No matter how attractive it is and compelling it seems, is too strong for you to resist in the power of God's grace. And he says, you are not alone. There is no temptation that you ever experience that is entirely, completely unique to you. Not one. It's common stuff we experience. So if you are battling in a particular area of temptation, then find someone who's more mature than you in your faith and ask them what they did and how they drew on God's strength. You must be diligent and persevere in your walk. Keep on trusting God. Keep on resisting. Keep on drawing on His strength. Don't be like the Israelites who failed to persevere in the conquering of the land and eventually succumbed to the people in the land and were led astray in all kinds of evil and displeasing ways to God and suffered the consequence for their lack of ability to persevere in the land. God has equipped you and given you everything you need for life and for godliness. You are not left without ability from God. Moreover, 
Notice too that he encourages them to face their enemies. And the reason he can encourage them to face their enemies is because God is fighting on their behalf. The battle does not belong to Joshua and the Israelites. The battle belongs to the Lord. And as long as they faithfully submit and live in obedience to God and follow the commands of God, God empowers them to win the battles. And so there is no enemy too great for them to face. Even the Anakites, who are giants, even they, as Nathan reminded us last week, even in spite of their great height and their uh, tallness, even they are conquerable because God fights on behalf of Israel. And the point, of course, for the Christian is that there is no enemy too great that you cannot defeat when it comes to temptation. Yes, Satan is like a roaring lion who prowls around, but he's been defeated by Christ on the cross. The teeth have been removed. He's got a loud roar. But there is nothing he can do to overpower you. For he has already been overpowered by Christ. And Christ has already made a mockery of him on the cross, triumphing over him on the cross. Colossians 2.15. And so whatever enemy you face in terms of the temptations that come knocking on your door, no matter how strong they are, God is stronger. Christ is more powerful and is able to help you to defeat those things that are your enemies. Notice, too, the mention of the Levites. It was a reminder to Israel that it wasn't the land that was their true inheritance, but God was their true inheritance. In other words, they could be taken out the land, the land was a gift from God, and the land was something to be enjoyed by them. But even if they were removed from the land, it didn't mean that they were somehow removed from God. And the Levites were positive proof of that. The Levites didn't get any inheritance in the land. They never had any uh, allotment like the 12 tribes had, the other, uh, the other 11 tribes had. They were simply uh, given places where they could live. But it wasn't their inheritance because their inheritance was God. And that was a reminder to the Israelites that ultimately it's not about the land. It's about the relationship with God. That is their true inheritance. So they could be removed out of the land as they were when they were in exile. And when you read through Daniel, Daniel and his friends continue to worship God because they may be out the land. But it doesn't mean they can't worship God. God is still around. And the same is true for us. Though there are things in life in this world that often sometimes come and threaten our relationship with God, and though there are times where we may be down in the dumps, and though there are times where our hearts may be spiritually cold, and though there may be times when our inheritance fades into the nothingness because it seems so far away and we don't have any visibility about what that inheritance is or we don't have great specifics about what's going to happen one day when we are in that inheritance. And it's easy to lose sight of that in the world because there's so many problems that encroach upon us and sometimes so many difficulties that we have to grope with. What God wants to remind us is that that is not something that should distract us, but rather our contentment, our fulfillment, our happiness is bound up in our relationship with Jesus. It's always been like that for God's people. It enables the believer when they are under the most severest of trial, under the most severest of suffering, under the most severest of pressure, missionaries who are out there being persecuted day in and day and night, some of them languishing in prisons where they are being tortured for their faith. They are able to cling to their faith and they are able to cling to their relationship with God and even in those circumstances they survive. Read Richard Wittenbrunt's uh, book about his suffering in that Romanian prison, how they made him stand uh, 24 hours without being able to move. He just had to stand and stand and stand and stand, and he couldn't sleep, and they wouldn't allow him to uh, fall down and sleep. And look at the scars that he once showed on his back as they took hot irons and they seared him and put it into his flesh and burnt his flesh. And he got to the point where he almost, almost died. And yet there was an underlying contentment and fulfillment in Richard Wittenbrunt because he knew that whatever they did to him couldn't change the reality of his relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that kept him going. So when the believers are, uh, you as a believer are under pressure, 
and when things are not going as you'd hoped, and when your plans are falling apart, and when it seems as though everything is just against you, you've got Jesus on your side. And he's the one that brings fulfillment. Yes, there's an inheritance that we're going to go to. Yes, there's a new creation. God is going to recreate this world and make it brand new again. And we're going to live in proper bodies in this new created world. But that's not the point. The point is we're going to be in the presence of Jesus Christ forever. That's the point. He is our inheritance. And you can enjoy that kind of contentment and fulfillment and purposeful life now. And then finally, though it's not explicitly stated here, there is the rest that this land gives to the Israelites. God promised them and said to them, from your wilderness wanderings, from the persecution you were experiencing in Egypt, that deliverance would ultimately result in coming into a land where you would have rest. And God would give them rest on all sides from their enemies if they would obey and live in submission to him. And when you read through the book of Deuteronomy, I'm going to encourage you to do that. You see how God promises them blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing. Their curse is there too, but the blessings are there if they would just follow God. And they, God promises and says to them, if you will obey me and worship me alone, you will have rest in the land. And that rest they enjoy from a wandering pilgrim people, from a persecuted people in Egypt, not having a land of their own, was a rest that was ultimately going to be found only in Christ because as the author of Hebrews reminds us, it isn't their final rest. If it was, God wouldn't say that there is a day still coming. And so God reminds through the author of Hebrews uh, chapter 3, chapter 7, there are lots of different places where it comes in Hebrews that there's a rest yet to have and the rest from which you and I will one day be able to be delivered into is the rest from the sin that we struggle with in this world. Finally, when we come into the kingdom of God that he's prepared from the creation of the world, finally, when we come into that new creation, you and I, our souls will finally be at rest. No longer will we struggle with temptation. No longer will we struggle with inadequacy. No longer will we struggle, struggle with disease and sickness and, and financial strain and job dissatisfaction. All of those things that cause our experience in some sense in this world to be marred because of sin and the effects that sin has had in the world, it's all going to be gone. And you and I will experience the rest of that new creation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Paul says in Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Or 1 Peter, 3, 1, Peter 1 verse 3 to 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's glorious power. You see, when we get to that day and that inheritance that we will enjoy no longer will we suffer from mold and rust and decay and clothes getting hold in them, holes in them. In that day, we will have a perfect world, restored as it ought to be. And we will be in the presence of Jesus. Our souls will be a perfect peace and perfect rest. And we will enjoy life in its most fulfilled form possible in the presence of God forever. That's the rest to which you and I look forward. That's the rest that God gave the people in the land, but it was never an eternal rest. It was never a permanent rest. Land can come and land can go, but the internal inheritance 
can never be taken away. It's there forever. So rather than allow circumstances to press us down, rather than becoming depressed in the failures that sometimes we experience in this world and the disappointments we go through, and sometimes the relationships that go sour and the hurt we experience from those relationships, we look forward to the day when we will receive our glorious inheritance, where we will be forever in the presence of Jesus in the newly created world, where we will enjoy life free from all the difficulties and problems that we experience in this world. It's glorious, and it's coming. And as Paul writes to the Thessalonians, I love the letter to the Thessalonians. We're looking at two Thessalonians in the morning, by the way. For those of you who you, you aren't there, you're missing out. But in 1 Thessalonians, he talks about, in verse 16, he says, There will be a loud command, the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet sound of God, and then Christ will appear, and history will be wrapped up. And when that occurs, the dead in Christ shall rise first, says Paul, and then we who are alive will be caught up with them. We will all experience that event. And all those who know Jesus will go to be with him forever. And those who don't know Jesus will be consigned to everlasting punishment in hell through their own choice, through their own rejection, through their own rebellion because Jesus Christ offers life to all without distinction. The free offer of grace is made to every person who lives. And so my question to you this evening is where are you headed? What inheritance awaits you I began by saying, where is Sean Connery now? Where will you be when, like Sean Connery, death comes knocking, taps you on the shoulder and says, it's time, it's time. Where will you be? I know where I'll be. Where will you be? Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the reminder of the inheritance that awaits all those who love you and know the Lord Jesus Christ, our inner relationship with him. You have created us to enjoy fellowship with you. You give us purpose. You give us meaning in this world. You help us to make sense of all that happens in this world. And you promise to all those who confess Christ as Lord, who believe in what he has done on their behalf, who trust him, you promise them there is a glorious inheritance. It's certain. It's a gift. It's coming. And we will enter into it as a result of the finished work of Jesus Christ and his finished work alone. So help us to take great comfort in that, to take great joy in that, to find great security in that. And for any here who do not have that security, who are unsure, who are a little bit nervous about all of that, oh God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, reach down into their soul and bring them to the foot of the cross. Bring light where there is darkness. Enable them to see the beauty of Jesus and all that he has done. And may they fall at his feet and cry out, O Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, for Jesus' sake. Amen.